The title of my sermon this morning is Why Christians Are Allowed to Fail God. Why Christians Are Allowed to Fail God. If there's any example in Scripture that is just so poignantly obvious of a, of a man who failed God, it was Peter. You know, after that Passover supper, and this was the last Passover supper for Jesus, we talked about that last week, but it was the first of the Lord's suppers for the disciples, and the Church of God has been celebrating the Lord's Supper in some churches every week, in some churches once a month on the first Sunday of the month, or in some churches it's the second Sunday of the month, or in some churches it's the third Sunday of the month, and in some churches, you guessed it, it's the fourth Sunday of the month, and I don't know why churches choose those particular rhythms, but in churches all over the world for all centuries, we have been celebrating the Lord's Supper ever since. So the last Passover for Christ became the first of the Lord's Suppers for his church. And Mark says that after they had celebrated this last Passover and the first Lord's Supper, they sang a hymn. And I remember when I was a kid in church, and my grandpa was the preacher at that time when I was quite young, and I remember he used to, after the Lord's Supper, every Sunday say, well, they sang a hymn and went out, so now we're going to sing hymn number and uh, we'd sing it, and then we'd go out. And I, you know, actually, Kevin, I, where's Kevin? I appreciate the selection of Great is Thy Faithfulness this morning. I love that hymn, and I can still hear my grandfather's booming voice, his bass voice, singing the bass line. So that's really the only part of the song that I know is the bass line. And I, I was singing that with as much gusto as I could project this morning. I hope you were, too. But they sang a hymn and went out. And I, I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't Great is Thy Faithfulness. The, uh, the Jewish tradition tells us that at the Passover, the Jews would sing what they call the Halal, which is a selection of psalms. And the hymn that Mark likely has in mind at the end of the Passover supper is the last part of the Halal, the last half of the Halal section of psalms. And, and that's uh, about Psalm 113 to 118. So it's quite a hymn. But part of that hymn, just near the end of that passage, just near the end of Psalm 118, there is a couple of words, there's a couple of lines there, verses 22 and 23, and I think it's on the screen for you on the next slide. And it's this. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. What a great hymn to conclude the Passover supper with. I, I would ask you to, you to do me this favor this morning, that as we look over this text of Mark 14, verses uh, 26 through 31, that you will let the words of this hymn be ringing in your mind. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. I don't know for sure that this was exactly the words that the disciples were thinking about or that this was exactly the, the hymn that they sang, but it's a pretty good chance. But I do know this, that if this was the hymn they sang, then Jesus that morning sang it with, or that evening rather, it wasn't morning, it was Thursday night for, for us, but Friday morning for them. Um, Jesus then sang it with meaning. You understand Why? He saw himself as that stone rejected by the builders. Jesus was that stone. And Jesus also understood that those builders who rejected him were going to be the, the chief priests and the scribes and the rabbis. And he knew what rejection by them meant. It meant crucifixion. It meant death for him. Jesus sang that hymn, I'm sure, with deep meaning and feeling. And I want you to look at that couple of verses there on the bottom of the screen and tell me, after the stone is rejected by the builders, what happens to it next? According to those verses, anyone, anyone brave enough? It becomes the cornerstone. A cornerstone is, uh, we, we could go into some technicality about it, but at least say this with me, that a cornerstone is a foundation stone. It holds the building up. And Jesus became that for us. The foundation of the house that God was building was going to be on Jesus Christ. So rejection for him, which meant death for him, was not the end for Jesus Christ, was it? 
was the beginning. Death was not the end for Jesus. It was the beginning. And these disciples later understood that. But right at this point in the story, they had no idea. Later they understood that the death of Jesus becoming laid as the foundation stone for the house God was building was really, really good news. And we're going to see this morning why. Look with me at verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. See, Jesus leads the disciples, all of them but Judas, who is now left, and Judas has said, Judas is understanding that he's, going, he's betraying Christ, and he's already made a deal with the chief priests, and now Judas has gone to do that. But Jesus leads the remaining disciples across the Kidron Valley to a favorite spot of his on the Mount of Olives. And as they walked, I imagine what they were thinking about. As they walked, they just sung this hymn. And I wish that they were all thinking, repeating the words of that, that hymn. You know, the, the stone rejected by the builders is going to be the cornerstone. This is God's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. I'd like to think that's what they were thinking, but I'm pretty sure it's not. I'll bet as they walked down, down just outside the, the perimeter of the, we would call it downtown Jerusalem, down into the Kidron Valley and across and up to the Mount of Olives, that they're, as they walk, I think they're thinking, what happened to Judas? Where's Judas? Where did he go? And the other, some other Gospels tell us that, that Judas got up from the supper and left to go fulfill his mission to betray Jesus. But these disciples don't know all of that. They just know that Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, and then he indicated Judas, and Judas leaves. I think they're full of resentment and blame and thinking, how could Judas leave like that? And then Jesus breaks the silence as they walk along with more bad news. Look at verse 27. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus isn't finished. He's got more to say there, but the reason I stopped there was because I think that's all Peter heard. I think Peter, judging from his response to Jesus' words, Peter really got hung up on verse 27 and didn't hear verse 28. Peter's response is powerful. And really, I think what Peter heard amounted to this in his ears. Judas has fallen away, and so will you. Can you imagine what Peter and the other disciples must have felt hearing Jesus say that? Can you put yourself in their shoes? You love this man. You love this teacher. You're not sure who he is exactly, but you believe is more than a man. Somehow he's sent by God and he claims to be God, but you don't quite understand that. But you love him and you've devoted yourself to him. And now he says, you're going to betray me too. You're going to fall away. Hurt, I think, is what they felt at that suggestion. That they could abandon their Lord. Dismay, I think, is what they felt. That 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 idea that he thinks that you might betray and abandon him like Judas did. But Peter, who I absolutely love in the New Testament. Peter, always passionate and always quick to speak. And I've at least got the second part of that. I, 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 I'm quick to speak. Someone says, I think this. I think, I, th- I think this. Someone says, I like Apple products. And I say, well, that's great. <laughs> Sometimes I say more. Sometimes I say more. But quick to speak. This is Peter. And he just, he can't, he can't take this sitting down. He's not going to betray Jesus. How dare Jesus even suggest it? I will never leave you, Lord. He affirms his loyalty to Jesus no matter what. And look at verse 29 for his response. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. Even though they all fall away, you can't quite depend on them like you can on me, Lord. I will never leave you. You know, I think I would say the same thing in his shoes. And I think you probably would too. Because who of us likes the idea that we would fail Jesus? I hate the thought of failing God. 
What about you? Some of you might not be at the place in your spiritual journey where um, you've committed to following Jesus. And maybe that doesn't kind of disturb your soul yet at the thought of falling away from him. You don't have anywhere to fall from. Really, You're not following him, and so you know, falling away wouldn't mean much to you perhaps right now. But for those of you who, like me, have committed yourself to Jesus, the idea of falling away is terrible. You know, there's a Greek word for falling away. It's not, I don't believe it's the word used in this passage, but the word for falling away is apostasy. Apostasia. Who wants to become an apostate? We've got a sign-up sheet at the back if you'd like. No! How horrible to think I might fall away from him. We never plan on falling away, do we? Is there ever a Christian who has planned on falling away from Christ? If someone told us we were going to fall away from Jesus, like Jesus told Peter and the other disciples this evening, if, if someone told us that, then we would deny it and we would fully intend to never betray him. However, that's not the gospel. The gospel is good news for this reason, that we all fall away. The gospel is good news for this reason. It's a good thing. The salvation of our souls does not depend on how vehemently we protest our loyalty or how strongly we affirm our commitment to him or even on how well we will obey our promises or keep our word to Jesus. Our salvation does not depend on our commitment, does it? It depends on his It doesn't depend on us keeping our promises to Jesus any more than Peter's did that particular evening, or the rest of the disciples for that matter. There is hope when we fail God. There is hope when we fail God. Because our hope never depended on us succeeding or failing at all. If our hope never depended on us keeping our promises to God, then our hope is not shattered when we break those promises out of weakness or sin. Okay, I was kind of waiting for that. If you stop and pause long enough, preaching schools tell you that someone will say amen, even just to keep the preacher moving. See, there is hope when we fail God, but not when our hope depends on our own resolve and our own promise and our own commitment. That hope cannot sustain us We need a stronger foundation than our own will. We need a stronger cornerstone than that. So the next point I see in this this passage is that Jesus demolishes false hope. In order to lay a new foundation, to lay a new cornerstone, Jesus demolishes false hope. Look with me at verses 30 to 31. And Jesus said to him, to Peter, Truly, I tell you, this very night, the Greek says, this day, this same night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. In fact, I think if we spoke in King James English, we could make a rhyme out of that. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me thrice. And and really, this is this... (laughs) But this is Jesus' word to Peter. You will deny me three times before this day is over. Resolve and determination are not enough to keep us from falling away from Jesus, my friends. Salvation for us, for the disciples or for Peter, never depended on what we do, and therefore it's never broken by what we fail to do. Salvation for, G- for us was never contingent on our strength The salvation of our souls has always and only ever depended on what Jesus has done. Now that is Christian orthodoxy, but do we all agree with that? Peter needed to learn that, as hard as that must have been. 
as hard as it must have been for him to see Jesus know this about him, what was going to happen, and to believe that Jesus believed it. I think Peter didn't believe it, but I think he believed that Jesus believed it, that he was going to betray him three times that same night. But Peter needed to be humbled by this truth of his own weakness and sin. And in time he was, within 24 hours. The disciples needed to learn it too, and we need to learn this. This is the hard part of preaching the gospel, if I can be frank with you. The fun part is Jesus saves. The hard part is from what? The disciples need to learn here, just as we do, that we must get to the point of confessing that as long as we are depending on our own strength or our own commitment, we will fall away. Jesus says in in verse 27, he says, all of you, you will all fall away. And he's, I, I think we can extend those words not to just those disciples, but to us when our hope is built on our own commitment. We will all fall away. When our hope is based on a wrong foundation, we will fall away. That's why Jesus predicted Peter's failure, that Peter would deny him three times before the rooster crowed twice, that Peter was going to break his word and fail Jesus. Jesus is saying this because Peter needed to hear it. You've got a wrong foundation, Peter. There must always be a demolishing of our false hopes before we can build on a true hope. There must always be a recognition of the deepness of our sin before we see the beauty of the Savior. There has to be repentance before faith. And what God wants to build needs a new foundation. So when Jesus said to those disciples, you will all fall away, it was to lead them to repentance. You remember in the beginning of Mark's gospel, he says what Jesus' message was from town to town to town. Repent and believe the gospel. So many of us would like to skip the first part because we don't want to face our sin. We just want to believe the gospel, the good news, without hearing and accepting the bad news. The good news is Jesus is a savior. The bad news is we need saving. The good news is Jesus is a healer. The bad news is we are broken. The good news is Jesus is the life giver. The bad news is we're dead, spiritually. So that's that song we sing, and I, it's one of my favorites, Christ is risen from the dead, gives us the command, wake up, wake up from your grave. Believe in Jesus and live, wake up. But first we've got to recognize we're dead, spiritually. And that's why Jesus predicted Peter's failure. It was to lead these disciples and Peter to true repentance. And he used scripture to show why this was necessary. Did you notice that? He used scripture to show why they would fall away. Did you, did you catch that part? Verse 27. He showed from scripture in Zechariah uh, 13 verse 7. He showed from this passage that this is the reason why the disciples will fall away. Look at verse 27. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it is written, or in in Greek it's the same word, because it is written. And I want to help connect what Zechariah 13, 7 there, the way Jesus uh, teaches it, why that means, why that shows a reason why the disciples would fall away. Because I think this is very important to, to, to go through that step there. The disciples were not merely going to fall away because the scriptures predicted they would. Although if that's what Jesus had meant, it would certainly be true. If the scripture says something is going to happen, you know what? My money is on the fact that it's going to happen. If Jesus says something is going to happen, I'll put all my faith in the fact that it will happen. John 1 tells us that it was the voice of Jesus that in the beginning said, let there be light. And you know what happened next? There was light. It was the voice of Jesus uh, that we see that Jesus said, Lazarus, who's dead, he has no ears that are working. Lazarus is lying in a tomb dead. And it was the voice of Jesus that said, Lazarus, come out. And you know what Lazarus, the dead person, did? He came out. The word of Jesus has authority to command into existence that which does not exist. The scripture tells us this. 
But here that's not what Jesus meant. Look with me again here. Jesus says in verse 27, You will all fall away because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. The disciples were going to fall away because their hope and faith in Jesus at that time, the reason they kept to him, the reason they were loyal to him, the reason they followed him was because he was alive. Their hope at that time depended on him being a living shepherd. What would happen when the shepherd was killed? This is what the scripture said, that the sheep would scatter. How many sheep does the scripture say will scatter? It implies all of them. And Jesus says, because of this scripture, I know you all will fall away. When he died, so did their faith at at that time in him. This is a hard thing to admit, but this is why the prophets of the Old Testament, why all these ancient prophets had predicted that the Christ would be abandoned and rejected in his death. So Isaiah 53 says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Daniel 9.26 says, And the Christ shall be cut off and shall have nothing. My translation. Psalm 88.18 says, You have caused, and this is the voice speaking in the voice of the Messiah, You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. See, when Jesus died, there were no believers left. There were people who loved him. There were people who mourned for him. There were people that still couldn't quite accept what had happened. There were people who grieved for him. But there were no believers anymore who trusted him for all the sheep scattered. There was no one whose confidence and faith remained in him. Their faith had died with him. Because their faith was not yet faith in what his death would do for them. Their faith was not yet faith in what his death would do. My friends, if there's one thing you grabbed this morning, I hope that's it. So it was not yet true faith in God that was resting on Jesus' death. It was not true faith in God that can sing a hymn about Jesus dying for us and celebrate. It was not true faith in God that depended on the fact that Jesus died for sinners. That's true faith in God. That doesn't isn't faith in spite of the fact that Jesus died, but is faith precisely because Jesus died. Paul says later, I I, I told you what I was given, I gave to you as of first importance that Christ died for sinners, according to the scripture. There are many people in the world who wear the label Christian, who are committed to following Jesus' teachings and example, even though he died. Or as if his path to death was a great virtuous path to, for us to follow as well. But the true Christian message, the, the, the faith of the church that God has built, would collapse like a house of cards if it was not built squarely on this cornerstone fact that Jesus died to save sinners. Is there anyone to say amen? Amen. His death was not something that happened to him as a victim. His death was God's plan all along. That that leads me to my next point, that God's church has one foundation and only one. And this is why the words Jesus quotes from Zechariah in verse 27 say this, and I hope you caught the pronoun. I, the way Jesus teaches this verse, I will strike the shepherd. Verse 27 of Mark 14. I will strike the shepherd. Who is speaking? Who is I in that verse? If Jesus is the shepherd, who is he saying will strike him? The Father God. The the crucifixion of Jesus wasn't an accident. God said 500 years before Jesus died, God said, I will strike him. 500 years before Jesus died on a Roman cross, 
God said, I will strike him. Before there were any Romans, much less crosses, God said, I will kill him. In fact, Revelation 13.8 shows Jesus' death to save sinners had been God's plan since before he created the universe. It was always God's plan. Revelation 13.8 shows John is uh, writing and John says, he writes of all those whose names are written in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, there was a book and this book was of the Lamb that was slain and our names were written in it before the found- before God said, let there be light this was God's plan all along that I will strike my shepherd and Zechariah says it's the voice of God the one the man standing next to me is my equal I will strike him and the sheep will be scattered see without Jesus death to take the punishment that our sins deserve there would be no hope for a Peter who denied Jesus three times that evening Without Jesus' death to take the punishment that our sins deserve, there would be no hope for those rest of the disciples who fell away and betrayed him the same night as well. Without Jesus' death as a substitute for sinners, as the scripture promises it was, there would be no hope for you and I when we fall away, when we fail God. Right? The church has one foundation, and it is this hope that Jesus died for sinners. If you don't see the gospel in the death of Jesus yet, if you don't see the death of Jesus as good news yet, then his death looks unnecessary and it looks horrible. But if you see what Jesus saw in his coming death, then there's nothing more beautiful or more wonderful. I would, I kind of, I would make this this drastic claim, and I've heard John Piper say similar things. I'm not getting this from him, but it's like something he would say, so I'm on pretty good ground there, that I think our eyes were created for this. That the, the purpose God gave us eyes to was to be able to see this truth. That doesn't quite make sense because the truth I'm talking is abstract and the eyes are physical, but you get what I'm saying. Maybe God gave us minds to grasp this truth. And that's why we have minds, is to grasp that the Son of God died for sinners. This is the highest thought. This is the most beautiful, wondrous thing we can behold. There is no better news in the world. The gospel in Jesus' death is why that Passover, that Passover hymn had the words... The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is why that hymn hymn writer, I think was probably David, why that psalmist wrote, this was God's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes when we begin to see the reason why the Lamb of God had to die for the sins of the world. When we begin to see what Jesus' death did for sinners. This is beautiful, isn't it? I think this is the reason why they sang that hymn that night and why God had maybe laid this as a foundation for the the Old Testament church and the New Testament church to sing this wonderful truth. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And they sang it. I think that, that truth is the reason why we sing this. When you begin to see the gospel in the death of Jesus, this is a reason to sing. In fact, it's a reason to write songs. When you begin to see the death of Jesus as gospel, it's the most beautiful reason in the universe to compose songs or to write books or or plays or poetry, to make movies, to, you know, draw art, paint with your brushes, to, to do things with, to build with your hands, to design architecture, to teach kids to read, to take care of people who are sick. To, to teach dance. There is no more reason, no more greater reason than this, that Jesus died for sinners, for anything we do. It gives meaning to everything that we do. God has done this. This is that all encompassing truth. This was the Lord's doing. And my question is this. Is it marvelous in our eyes yet? 
Do we see that the house, the true spiritual house God is building full of saved sinners rests on the foundation of the death of Jesus Christ, the cornerstone? In the words that hymn, do we agree it is marvelous of our, in our eyes? My friends, do we agree? Look with me at Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6. And do we see this is marvelous in our eyes? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's no better truth in the world. This was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Is the death of Jesus to save sinners that marvelous to us? See, it's very human and normal to flinch at this gospel, to sort of react and resist and put up our hands and say, not me. You don't need to die for me, God. I'm not that bad. But that's like saying, like, Peter, I will n- they might all fall away, but I will never fall away. It denies human nature. To protest that we are not that bad, that Jesus didn't need to die for us. Look again at verse 31. But Jesus said, or Peter said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. How long can you hide from this truth? How much longer can we wear this mask that says, I'm not that bad? I'm pretty good compared to other people. How long can you keep up the facade that you've got it all together, that you are strong enough or good enough to face your death apart from the death of Jesus Christ for you? After Jesus was raised from the dead and and after Peter's own faith came to rest on this rock, on this cornerstone truth that Jesus died for his sins, After that had happened, Peter, later on, he sang this song, this hymn for the rest of his life. He wrote a book, a a letter later, we call it First Peter, to encourage and sustain the faith of Christians who were suffering. And in this letter, quoting from a different part of the Bible, he wrote uh, nearly the same words that were in that hymn. He quoted almost the same words from the book of Isaiah, and he said, For it stands in Scripture, this is First Peter 2, 6, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. How do you think Peter felt all those years later looking back on that evening when he had denied Jesus three times? If that was you, how would you feel? I know how I would feel. I'd likely feel shame. But not Peter. See, many years later, though he didn't forget that sin, many years later he looked back on it not with a sense of failure and shame and guilt, but with gratitude and joy. Because he learned eventually that since Jesus paid the punishment our sins deserve, there is no more shame. There is no more guilt for when we have failed him. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not because of how good we are or how hard we try or how deep our commitment to him, but because of his love and grace for us. In Jesus Christ. This was the Lord's doing, and it is what? Marvelous in our eyes. So Jesus was the stone the builders rejected, but he was also the cornerstone on whom God began to build his church, and that was the good news. That was the good news that even then Jesus was holding out for his disciples to hold on to. Look at verses 27 all the way through to verse 28 this time, which I skipped before. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Verse 28, But, 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 
All the sheep will be scattered, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Do you notice how this involves the scattering of the sheep and then the gathering of the sheep? I will go before you to Galilee. After he was raised up and met the disciples in Galilee, their faith would then begin to rest on this new cornerstone, on this fact that Jesus' death was for them, for their sins. And it would rest not only on the fact of his wonderful sacrificial death, but also his victorious resurrection. Oh my goodness. Because of this truth and that cornerstone now that these disciples' faith was transplanted upon, now they became missionaries after his resurrection. Missionaries and builders of God's church calling people from all nations to place their entire confidence on one rock, on one foundation. The crucified and risen cornerstone. My friends, I don't think this passage could... I I, I think that the meaning of this passage for you and me is very, very clear. In these words of Jesus, it's very clear for us. We often wish that we could be strong and good and righteous and pure so people would admire us. We wish we could be people people would look up to. Don't we? Uh, Am I the only one? Hands? Who wishes other people admired you for who you were? Are, will be. But the fact is that we are all a lot more like wandering sheep than wonderful shepherds. We used to have sheep on the farm that I grew up on, and sheep stink and they bleat. They're noisy, they're annoyed, they're stupid. And we bleat and we complain and we fall into ditches and we get separated from the flock. As John Newton said, I know this truth, I am a great sinner, but Christ is a great Savior. See, we wander like sheep, but we have a wonderful shepherd. Peter the failure became Peter the faithful. Not because he tried harder the next time. Let's stop doing that. Let's stop resting our faith on how well we obey our commitments to Christ. Let's move our faith so it rests on the one foundation that Jesus died for sinners. And then God raised him from the dead in victory. The gospel means this, that we are allowed to fail. But this glorious hope, this wonderful thing that we see, this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. This marvel is a wonderful reason to persevere and not give up. I want to leave you with the words that Peter wrote much later on. In 1 Peter 1, verses 8 through 13, this is a transformed man, not because he tried harder, but because his faith was now resting on the solid rock. And Peter says this in 1 Peter 1, verses 8 through 13, and I close with this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, because of this gospel, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. Set your hope fully on this cornerstone. We thank you, Father, for your goodness, for your word, for the authority that rings out and calls us to put our trust squarely on one foundation, namely the death of Jesus Christ for sinners and his victory and his resurrection. 
We thank you that we are justified by faith and not by our works. And we ask that you would lead us to repent from our works, lead us to repent from faith that is hollow and empty and depends on us, and lead us to put our faith only on the solid rock, Christ, our cornerstone. Lead us to holy lives as a result, Lord Jesus. We pray for your glory and yours alone. Amen.